Welcome back to another special edition of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. And I, by by special, I mean a new segment. Um, we we pride ourselves on talking about a lot of things on the show, and we talk about everything, and that's what the name of the show is: Crossing Board Cross Border Interview Podcast. So, politics, authors, entertainment. We talk about it all. Nonprofit organizations, drag queens, uh, health issues. We talk about it and because we want to make sure that we don't focus just on one thing. And then our resident conservative like me pundit and all around amazing political pundit on the show said, um, aren't you forgetting one thing? And I thought to myself, well, what is that? She said, how about all borders? How about international borders? And I thought, well, how did I screw that one up? So here we are. The last Wednesday of the month and going forward, the last Wednesday of every month, we'll be crossing all borders on the Cross Border Interview podcast. So what do we mean by that? We mean we'll be talking about the biggest international news across the world, hence international, and we'll be talking about it every last Wednesday besides December and June. We'll talk about that later, but every Wednesday, last Wednesday of the month, not every Wednesday, but the last Wednesday of each month, we'll be talking about international news with our new international pundit, Miss Jennifer Sanford. Jennifer, sorry for that long-winded introduction, but here we are. <laughs> Thank you so good. much for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm. I really think that uh, this is an important thing to bring to this podcast. I mean, your listener base continues to grow and Canadians are listening. And I think one of the things that we're really trepid about is where we fit in the international space. And I think a, a, an opportunity to digest it. Um, and don't worry, just because I'm a conservative pundit doesn't mean I'm not going to be, I'm going to be an unfair pundit. So uh, well, I think it's, and I, will I think it's going to be account. great. <laughs> and he will, and don't worry. Yeah, you will. Um, but I think let's, let's talk about some of the international things, because I think we need more conversation about it. Um, and then also, I just want to mention before we do get into this episode that over the last two and a half months, this uh, this podcast, this show has grown considerably here in Calgary, across Alberta, but also around the world. I was looking at stats uh, when we record this Monday morning. This is coming out Wednesday. Uh, on Spotify alone, we have over 2,100 active subscribers to the show. On Apple Podcasts, we have over 1,500 active subscribers. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you continue on with the show after the municipal election that we just went through, because we are going to be talking about a lot of different things over the next few months. And like we did during the municipal election, five days a week, every week, we will be having new shows out. Um, but this one is about international news. So if you're an international news junkie, this is the, sh this is the episode for you. And this is the best way to uh, bite your teeth onto the show if you like international news. So to start this off, uh, we need a preamble here because this is the big thing. Where does Canada fit on the international stage today? Uh, there is a lot of talk about where we are. Does Justin Trudeau still have an international uh, look forward? Uh, how is he being handled on the international stage with the G7 leaders, with the NATO leaders, with the five... Uh, I, five eyes uh, nations. So we're going to be talking about where Canada fits on the international stage. So to start this off, I'm going to ask Jen right now, point blank, in your opinion, is Canada still an international player? No. How so? Uh, I, you know, I think Canadians should be worried. Uh, because currently we have um, a government and, and I want to be clear that this is not a criticism of just Justin Trudeau's government. I will extend this out into the last years of the Harper government as well, to be completely fair. But where we sit today is I think we are a government that lacks strategy. I think we lack an understanding of what cooperation really is. And I think most of all, we lack what I call intentionality, which is that we, we look at our position in the world stage through a lens of understanding what our role is and being able to, to bring to other countries a firm understanding of this is what we perceive our role to be and you can depend on us to be that role. Um, I think that the, the biggest challenge that we have is that we're using trade policy and foreign policy interchangeably. 
I think we think that one is one is the other and, and, and vice versa. And I think that that's not serving Canada. And I think you're seeing that manifest itself in a couple of ways. I mean, certainly we had another failed uh, bid for a, uh, a UN Security Council seat. And I think that that was largely a rebuke of you say things and then you don't quite follow through on them or you make a lot of you know great rhetoric statements, but then what does that really manifest itself um, you know, as we try to accomplish goals in the, in the spirit of what the UN was, was built to do since it was the League of Nations. The other, the other piece to that is that I think that we really, are relying on our history to, to support our future and, and not to be flippant about it because I don't think you can be flippant about international relations, but it was like, because peacekeeping was such an important part of our history. I mean, the prime minister of Canada, Lester Pearson won the Nobel peace prize for peacekeeping. And it's, it's really a, a national pride point. It's something that we can be proud of at a time when we're struggling to be proud of our, of our Canadian history. That is something that we can be very proud of. That was a visionary statement, but it's like being the, the, the quarterback in high school and you, ha- you know, you date all the, the cool girls. And then all of a sudden you're 50 years old in the bar telling people like, Oh, I was, I was really popular in high school. I think that's where we are now. We haven't really innovated and said, this is what we are and this is where we belong. And we pay our bills to the UN and, 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 and this is how we're leading with intentionality. And I think until we figure that out, I think Canadians should be worried about where they fit in the international stage. Has the international stage collapsed though? Because in the last five years, we have seen the rise of Trumpy, Trumpism in America, where it's the me first and only me first. And I think a lot of countries have now gotten to the point where it is the me first policy, uh, America first, Canada first, UK first. Does Canada still have a role to play in a society where we are moving towards a me first policy, though? You know, I I don't think you can, just to sort of recalibrate the question, I don't think you can equate a me first vision to solely a a Trump thing. And and we'll talk about this, I'm sure, when we talk about Canada-US relations. But I think we also saw people getting very nationalistic during COVID as well, right? When the supply chain fell apart and we realized we couldn't get anything and and, and the countries who manufactured things were faring far better than countries that weren't. Um, I think we saw everybody say, I, you know, I have to take care of my citizens. I have to take care of my citizen, my citizens needs, but, you know, to be fair, there are countries that are still balancing the individual needs of their country with the greater good of their international cooperation. Multilateralism is continuing. I think, um, for as much as I have a lot of criticisms of 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 Trump for his, you know, his his really uh, punishing view of the United Nations, I think what he did do was he really did raise a flag to the United Nations to say, what really is your goal? Why does the United States need to be seen as like the central body to get everything done, which is a fair question to be asking. And, and what is it that the UN actually wants to accomplish? And I think asking those questions to the UN I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Now, I hate the way in which they were packaged by him, but that's often my criticism of him. But, you know, it's important to remember that even in the absence of of President Trump and the advent of President Biden, those questions are largely still being asked. Like, what actually is the role? What actually do we want to accomplish here? What is the mandate and how can we cooperate better? Multilateralism is continuing. And I think so long as we have serious problems to solve, like climate action and climate-based human migration. I think human migration is the conversation we're not having as a, as a nation and as a globe. Um, you know, multilateralism will, you know, will continue. There, there's still armed conflict. There's still, you know, issues that need to be addressed from a, a distributed point of view, not just a singular point of view. So I think it still exists, but I think everybody has had to recalibrate how they fit. So does that answer your question? It, it does, but it, it opens up another question as well. So okay. why does Canada need to be on the international stage? Uh, you know, that's a great question. And I think Canadians should be asking that question every day. For me, what, what it manifests itself as is we have an opportunity to bring a, a tremendous point of view around economic and environmental balance. I think that that's well within our purview. 
we have a responsibility, I think, because we are a highly educated um, base of, of citizens. Um, you know, we have a, a great potential for innovation, that innovation can serve the world stage. I think we bring a, pra well, I think we once did bring a very pragmatic view of, of respecting individual rights while also looking at the greater good. I think we, we offer a sense of context, but we, <laughs> only if we want to, only if we want to. Uh, you know, I, I feel I feel like your question is very close to remember I was talking about the difference between trade policy and foreign policy. I ask this question all the time in trade, right? Why are we tr trying to trade with these massive, massive countries? Why don't we trade with countries that are our size, like our ge not our geographic size, but our population size? I think that's a valid question to be asking. But I think every country has a responsibility to play a role because we are trying to solve big questions. And we also have to look at the absence of that role. And I'll come back to climate based human migration. Let me just pull up this graph because I just heard it on the weekend. So um, the new Lancet report is out and they, so it's the La uh, Lancet countdown report. And they talk about how the world could see up to 1 billion climate refugees. So let's just look at climate-based human migration as one example, because Chris, you know, I'm passionate about climate-based human migration because I think it's at the intersection of Canada and our environmental needs, our biodiversity, our food stability, our immigration policy, I think it's at the nexus of us having to do some really hard thinking. We have at this time um, a, a significant number of, of global citizens on the move because their homes and their places where they live and they've, and they've created a sense of home is not inhabitable to them anymore due to changes in the climate. I mean, we'll use the example of Bangladesh. Bangladesh is sinking. There's nothing we can do but to save Bangladesh. I don't know why we can't just, I, like even when I see immigration forms and they're like reason for immigration, I don't know why there's just not a box. This is Bangladesh. Like I just, it's, it's sunk. Like I don't, so I, I'm digressing here, but I, I think as we look at the massive migration of people, I mean, we've seen what's happened to Europe when we saw the massive migration of people from, from Northern Africa and in, in the Middle East, that MENA region and the destabilization of Syria. Um, as we have more climate movement, you know, Canada is going to become a very desirable place to be. And frankly, uh, we need a small portion of these people to come because we, we, we need the population growth. We simply don't regenerate enough population on our own. We need these, we need these immigration numbers in order to fuel, um, what we aspire to be as a country. The challenge that we have is that if we don't participate in international and multilateral negotiation, we don't have a seat at the table to decide what is and is not in our direct best interest. How, how do we want to play a role in supporting the mass migration of people? And that's just one example. So I think there's the question of, do we have to have a position at the, at the world stage? And I think you look at it as, what are the consequences to us from a policy perspective if we do not? Canada has been known to be able to walk and run at the same time deal with domestic issues as well as international issues. Chrétien was king of this. Mulroney was good at this. Martin, eh, Stephen Harper, like you said, beginning, he, he seemed to be able to do it. And then he got complacent. And then by 2011, he just sort of walked away from it and wasn't able to do both at the same time. And Justin Trudeau, and I think you and I will both agree, uh, I don't think he can walk, just walk in general, besides even walk and run at the same time. I don't think he wants to. Well, and that's true to. too. That's true too. Maybe he doesn't want to. Maybe he just wants to dress up and go around to India and dress up and whatever he thinks. Oh man, is that was bad. But before you're going to ask your question, I will interject to say that I think when you have a prime minister that only looks at return on investment, like will this yield me goodwill? You know, Canadians have now also become as citizens very complacent about foreign policy. And so I think we do have a prime minister that says people don't care. So I, sh I won't care either. And it's also complicated and hard, and he doesn't really thrive in those kind of environments. Now, we are recording this the day before the uh, pending cabinet shuffle. Yes, we are. Uh, Mark Arnault is the current, as of this right now, as of recording this Monday at 8 o'clock in the morning, Mark Arnault is the current foreign affairs minister. There is speculation that he could be changed up and someone else could be put into that position. Has this position in Canada, and I know we're still talking about Canada, we haven't even gotten to the topics that we want to talk about, about international, but we got to start with Canada here first. Has foreign affairs, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Canada become sort of a joke? Because 
you do not see the gravitas of when I'm just looking at Bill Graham, the former foreign affairs minister under Martin and Chrétien. When he went to uh, different countries, people stopped and paid attention. Lawrence Cannon, I can't imagine Lawrence Cannon going out under Stephen Harper and getting that same poll. Mark Garneau, first Canadian in space, and yet no one cares that he's on this massive worldwide tour right now. Yeah, and Champlain before him. I exactly. Mean, it was just- it was, a, it was just um, even Freeland before him. <laughs> true. I, I So again, this comes back to my central point around, you know, the, I think the global community has figured out that Canada at this time has no strategy. They have, they have no real understanding of, of cooperation uh, in the context of, of, of policy and, and, and honoring commitments that they're being asked to make. And then we do not have intentionality. And I think that you're seeing that manifest in how Canada is treated. I don't think it matters how much you switch out the man or the woman into the role. I think what matters is that the international stage is like, yeah, they, I mean, it's very unusual. I mean, and, and this didn't even get great salience. Thank God for the, for the, for McLean's for covering it. But you know, this year, the United Nations even sent an open letter to Canada to say, you use our resources, you come to Geneva, you, you, you know, you sit in our meetings, you, you make a lot of great commitments in the room. Then when it's time to put them on paper, you cannot be found, right? You, you make commitments, you don't honor them. You, you talk a big, you know, a big game about being part of, of, of initiatives with us. And then when it's time to have the rubber hit the road, we don't know where you are. We're very frustrated because we believe you're performing under your, under like below your full potential. That's a stunning, that's a stunning rebuke of a, of a country who once brought a program so prolific to the United Nations that it was Nobel Peace Prize winning work, like how the mighty fall. And I think that, that, yeah, I think that this, this comes down like fish stinks from the head. This comes down from needing a prime minister to have a foreign affairs vision that is compelling and rallies Canadians to say, okay, this is where we fit and not conflating it with trade policy because that's its own bird. Yeah. And we'll talk about trade policy probably in a future episode, but I want to talk about the UN for a second before we do move on, because right now we have a ambassador to the UN, Bob Ray, former liberal leader, interim leader, former Ontario premier. His father was in that position as well. Um, Bob Ray is well respected across Canada, across party lines, I would even say. I think he's respected by conservatives. I think he's respected, well, not by Ontario NDP because he jumped ship to the liberals when he saw a potential of power. Has Bob Ray done a good job in your opinion so far? Because he's been in that position for almost a year and a half, two years. And I I, I follow him on social media. I, can't, I, I know he did say some good things about China. He took China to task a few times when Mark Garneau was down there about the Michaels. But has Bob Ray made an impact on the United Nations? You're the expert on the United Nations. What's your opinion? Um, Well, we can't just acknowledge that it's just Bob Ray. He's in New York, but don't forget, we also have an ambassador to Geneva as well. So we have to remember that we've got the two. As it comes to Bob Ray, I, I feel, and this is no disrespect to Bob Ray because I, you know, I've, I've sat in rooms with Bob Ray. I think every Canadian has somehow. Um, Bob Ray every Bob Ray. <laughs> yeah. And this is exactly my point. Bob Ray is Bob Ray. And I think what you found is that he's um, because we don't have a, like a mission and a vision and values and intentionality. I think it was like, let's send Bob Ray down there. He's like your friendly neighborhood, Mr. Rogers. He's going to say some great things, but he's going to do no harm. Right. And I, I think that they, that's what he's largely done is he's gone to the UN and, and been like, Hey, Bob's here. Right. Like we couldn't have sent a more Canadian Canadian to represent Canada at the UN in New York. Yeah. And I think that that's what he's doing. He's doing like the events and saying like, Hey, Canada's here. And you know, I'm checking all the boxes, but because we don't have intentionality and a vision, I think he's just in New York being the ambassador to, to Canada. And I, I have the same complaint um, in Geneva. Um, you know, Canada's largely silent. They don't know what's important to us, why those things are important to us, what we're aspiring to do, what we want to be a part of and what we're concerned about. Um, I think we just like show up at the meetings, you see the little Canada placard there and some, you know, either the ambassador or somebody who's part of that particular mission sits down and, you know, just waits to vote, presses their vote and leaves. And I think that 
that that again is a is a is a reflection that we're not prepared to 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 really lead with purpose on the world stage. I try to pride myself on knowing sort of the international news of where people are appointed, who's appointed to what position and all that. I couldn't tell you right now who the ambassador to the UN in Geneva is. Yeah, so Leslie Norton is uh, the permanent Did you just have to look that up? No, I didn't have to just look it up, but I did pull it up to make sure that it didn't change between the time I was in the UN and the time I was back. Uh, I mean, different groups have different representatives, um, but yeah, no, we've got, and there's another woman there. Um, there's another, cause hang on. Now I do have to look it up. <laughs> but at the same time, I will say that um, I, like I said, I pride myself on knowing who the ambassadors are in the United Nations, across Canada, across, around the world. And the United Nations has never been a big selling point for me knowing who they are. I only know Bob Ray's because like you said, everyone he's knows Bob, Bob Ray. Ray. Everyone knows Bob Ray. If you don't know Bob Ray, it's like, have you lived under a rock for the last 40 years of your life? So, But do you ever think that his appointment was a way to really close that portfolio? Because there is an inherent sort of colloquial trust and confidence in Bob Ray that I think it was a strategic appointment to send him so that everyone's like, oh, we don't have to worry. It's Bob Ray. Bob's Bob's got it. Bob's there. Completely. And and I think that it was a way of saying like we can just simply close that as a priority to Canadians. I I do think his appointment was strategic in that front as well. Completely agree to that statement. There's no 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 second guessing that one. But Let's move on to the big, the big international border that is actually one of the biggest inter- openly accessible international borders outside of COVID-19 because we're in lockdown and we're still not technically open until next month, but that's here nor there. And that is Canada-US relations. Um, yes. They have been friendly, uh, I would say, for the 80s, the 90s, Reagan and Mulroney, we all remember Irish eyes, uh, Cretchen and Clinton, we remember golf. Yeah, like Obama and and Trudeau, yeah. Exactly, the bromance, Stephen Harper (laughs) and George Bush, like the three amigos down in front of the Aztec pyramids in Mexico. These are friendly times. Um, We are now at a moment in time where we have an old guard in the US, which is Joe Biden. He is the traditional Democrat of the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. And we have the upstart here in Canada, Justin Trudeau. I say upstart, but the sort of relatively newcomer to politics when it comes to international politics. Is Joe Biden looking across the border and saying, I, I don't have an ally in Canada anymore? Uh, No, I think it comes back to your earlier point, which is that everybody is focused on their own business right now. Uh, I think one of the things, again, we are not talking about with the United States is that, you know, love him and loathe him and a good portion of Canadians loathe him. Donald Trump ushered in this era of America first. We're going to manufacture here. We're going to employ here. We're going to build here. We're going to trade here. We're going to really create an ecosystem that is fueled by Americans for Americans. That was that was really, and of course, he would find the, the most egregious way to present that argument to Americans and the world. But that really was the vision of, of a Trump-led administration. Joe Biden has largely remained with that vision. He really has continued to say, what does this country need to do to fuel itself? And I think, again, COVID-19 really just compounded that argument uh, with greater salience. So um, I think just to put that around an an example for for people who are listening and, and feeling like I don't really know what that means. When the United States announced that they were switching from combustion engines to electric vehicles, right? We know that the manufacturing industry, car manufacturers are, they're all in on it. This idea that we're gonna transition from from fossil fuels into electric energy. And car manufacturers have set a date and you see the commercials and you see the advertising and the pitch to, to stakeholders and investors all the time that this is where we're going. The story that's not being told with that is that that chip that will be in those electric cars is going to be manufactured in the United States. That's also part of this deal. Right. So that car is going to come from the United States. 
well, where are cars manufactured? Cars are manufactured just across the way in Southern Ontario. And so there's an example. Not sure if you've been back in Southern Ontario recently, but not anymore. Let's be honest. No, but if you if you follow the the sheer noise that is Jerry Diaz, you're knowing that he's fighting very hard in the interest of auto workers where the ink is set. The fate has been issued uh, on what is going to happen with car manufacturing uh, for North American cars. North American cars are no longer North American cars. They're American cars now. And I think that we have to appreciate that that decision has been made, that ink has been signed, and now it becomes beholden upon the government, not the union, becomes beholden upon the government to say, okay, now what are we going to do with those people who have participated in this manufacturing industry, right? Do we provide them with a pathway to immigration so they cross the, they cross the border into, into Michigan and, and Wisconsin and continue to manufacture there? Uh, do we try to find some agreement where it's like an open border? Because you have to remember that like Windsor, Ontario and Detroit, like it, there's four miles apart, right? Do we look at some sort of a, a working corridor? Um, this is where we see international relations come in. Instead, what are we getting? We're getting, you know, no news coverage of this, of this decision from the United States. Jerry Diaz going crazy, living in a fantasy world of what is and is not possible and a prime minister who's not having a real conversation with Canadians. That is one example that am, like amplifies my frustration between Canada and U.S. relations. And you're really seeing an America that says, we don't really know what Canada's doing. We don't, this is so dysfunctional. We're just going to do our own thing. But the momentum to do their own thing was really there. They didn't wait for a catalyst from, from Canada, let's be clear. But when when, when, you know, when Justin Trudeau has to tweet out, like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm standing behind America. I talked to Hillary Clinton last night. You know, I love the tweets who are like, you know, that she's not the president, right? You know that. And it's because they can't get Biden on the phone. And we saw this in the, in the, in the G7 uh, conference, which you lovingly picked on me for continuing to call the G6, because I was like, we should not be there. Um, you know, there's no time there was America just said, like, you know, how can we help you even opening this border? What a dysfunctional opening of the border. America's like, if you're fully vaccinated, come in, come out. Canada's like, if you're fully vaccinated, go out, but then we still need this $200 test. When you come in, we're going to create a barrier for you to participate. That's, you know, that's just ridiculous thinking. That's saying, we're not going to work with you. That's saying, okay, you find your system and I'll find my system and let's just open up this border and hope that nothing goes wrong. So I did not sound like we're picking on Canada only here because I don't think we should be because I think there's issues on both sides of the border when it comes to this whole reopening thing because even congressmen and congresswomen in the Democratic Party were calling on Joe Biden to open the borders a lot sooner and Joe Biden just did not seem to even care about that border he was more worried about the UK and Europe so I I think all the blame should not be laid upon Justin Trudeau he does take responsibility that he's not able to get Joe Biden on the phone but we should be talking about Joe Biden and his whatever type of leadership he has because right now I think he's just throwing things at the ceiling and hoping that it will stick under this Congress so that's 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 my brief foyer into American it's politics. It's a tough Congress. I, I, I would yeah. like to, for someday for the story of what actually really was going on with the border to, um, you know, to come up, you know, we're still trying to get an ambassador. Uh, I, like America still does not have an ambassador to Canada. It's been two years, you know, that matters. Why aren't we saying that that's a priority? Yeah. We have not had an ambassador since August 24th, 2019. Yeah. The entire Probably- Period. Kelly Craft, Republican donor to the Trump presidency, was our last official, full fledged ambassador from the United States to Canada. Um, we currently do have David Cohen, who is up for a vote. It is supposed to happen this week. Um, the Republicans have been stalling this because of a bill that they do not like. Uh, David Cohen, for those who don't know, is a former vice president of Compact Comcast. If you do not know what that is, that is the owner of NBC Entertainment. Yeah, so yes, telecom. <laughs> we have a an interesting ambassador coming to Canada if they set up a shop. Um, people are also leaving Canada as well. The Consular General here in Canada, who came to my wedding, uh, in Calgary, who came to my wedding, left 
and there was no fanfare. Was, she just left after the election, and here we are. We have we have buildings in this country that are sitting vacant with one of our biggest partners. I don't think the Republicans care that a Canada doesn't have a representative. They didn't have one under the Trump administration. They don't need one under the Joe Biden administration. They'd rather <laughs> worry about China and Russia. But the big question is, is, is how much should we care? I mean, we have to realize that we've made conscious decisions not to have a military because we believe we will be bolstered by an American military. Like, I mean, there's, there's questions about like our security Intel, we have CSIS, which is what 25 guys in a room somewhere doing something. We're not really sure. You know, we've largely relied on the Intel of, you know, the major intelligence infrastructure of the United States to help us to manage and mitigate threat. You know, we are very reliant on the United States. You know, they are our largest trading partner and, you know, to see these vacancies continue to see an unwillingness from the, from the U S government to really fully engage. And I mean, you know, look at that new security agreement, Australia, the UK, Canada wasn't even consulted. Well, France wasn't either. And they're up, they're up in arms as well. They're that, that agreement, which you're talking about where Australia was given nuclear submarines to combat China's, uh, growth in the Pacific Ocean has a lot of people pissed off right now. So I don't think, and yet again, this happened during the election and Canada seemed to just go, eh, oh, it happened. Okay. Even the opposition went, ah, Canada's not involved. And they just moved on. Even the conservatives know that this is not like, they are so far out without a foreign policy issue as well, that this is this is a compelling thought. We probably should have talked about this at the top because there is a frustration that I hold that it's not like you have the governing party who doesn't care and then you have an official opposition who's like, I we have a we have a thought and we have a strategy. This was always my big beef of Aaron O'Toole as a military person. It never it doesn't come to the table. And look at where we are today. Justin Trudeau wins the most important election of our generation and takes like a month and a half to form a cabinet when they're not even going to sit in the House of Commons until Christmas lights are up. And then you have the Conservative Party who can't even they just lost the plot. Honestly, they're just like vaccines. I'm like, oh, for goodness sake, just quit taking the bait. You just took the bait. And in the meantime, you know, we have serious problems. We need a serious infrastructure to solve them. And it's not there. And it's not like there's more depth in the bench. Like, let's talk about Judmeet Singh and foreign policy. Let's talk about what will be the reemergence, I'm sure, of Elizabeth May on foreign policy. Like, there's none. There's no. Let's have Yves Francois Blanchet, who largely thinks whole swaths of Canada are pieces of shit. Like, let's have him take on foreign policy. Like, there's no depth in the bench anywhere to look at international relations as a, as a source of intentionality and pride. Exactly. And we are at a moment in our time where we are seeing, this is the perfect segue into our next segment here. We are seeing the emergence of a superpower that is overtaking the former superpower that was the United States of America. We are seeing the, the rise and the tentacles of the Chinese government, the People's Communist, People's Party of China or however you want to call them. We are seeing the rise of the Chinese government in a lot of things right now. And we do not have any pushback because we are so distracted by other issues that are happening internationals. And this is the one I wanted to talk about before we talk about China is Russia. Russia seems to have been the big boogeyman that Trump that Harper, that Obama, that Blair, Gordon, Cameron, Theresa May, Angela Merkel all seem to be focusing on, focusing in on for the last 10 years. And while they were doing that, China got stronger, China got louder, and China started talking to a lot of different governments, particularly in the Middle East, which is going to cause a lot more issues in the future. On China, We, as Canadians, should be upset, angry, and pissed off, but it seems like we have the attention span of a gnat. We had two people. We still have one person in China jail, in the Chinese jail, being held for longer than the two Michaels were. We have people in Chinese jails right now who are still there, but 
we have two Michaels. Thank God they're back on Canadian soil. I think everyone took a sigh of relief that day when their plane touched down here in Calgary. But China, China is the, we need to be worried about China. And I don't think any leader is actively looking at them and going, okay, we need to have a serious conversation about them because we, we want to have a more serious conversation about Russia and Vladimir Putin. What's your thoughts? Well, for, first of all, China's formal name is the People's Republic of China, but I always enjoy how often people are like the People's Party of China because <laughs> just put those two things together, much I'm sure to the chagrin and or joy of Maxim Bernier. So um, yeah, we absolutely have to look at China as being um, the preeminent superpower. Um, you know, I, I, as you know, Chris, I go into great detail about China and, and where they're at and how they emerged on my own podcast. I have an entire episode about China. If people want to check it out on a conservative like me, there's my plug for the day. Uh, but not to, not to restate everything I say in that podcast, but I think that, you know, the, the, the old, the old expression of, um, you know, uh, when she sleeps, she will emerge as a dragon. Um, that has clearly occurred and they did it with sheer economic force, uh, which I think is the future of how world superpowers will be declared. Um, and they're doing it in tandem with a strong military. So they know that they've got a backup, um, to their, to their economic power, their belt and road initiative, their rail and their sea initiative is going to change absolutely everything about how we understand how the world works. Um, they now in, in effect through economic power, uh, and the sheer amount of infrastructure they've pushed into these countries, they effectually own large swaths of, of the, of the middle East and, and, and tips of Africa. And that matters. That should matter, um, to, to Canadians and to, and to every country that aspires to understand foreign international relations. Um, as it relates to the two Michaels, let's just break it into parts. As it relates to the two Michaels, so great to see them home. So great to see them well. I think there was a concern that this might be a repeat of what Americans experienced with Otto Warmbier, where he arrived home, but was not in a state of um, mental and physical wellness to survive. Let's just put it that way. Um, basically, well, I just, I just want to clarify it. here because I think I'm thinking about someone different here. Otto was in North Korea though, right? Absolutely. Okay. But when you see a trade-off between one country to another. But there was uh, no for, trade-off. There was no for, trade -off. Uh, There was absolutely a trade-off. Like, I just, I just don't understand why we just can't look at the situation pragmatically. The minute the U.S. found uh, a, a deferred prosecution agreement for uh, Meng, the two Michaels were released. There's no other narrative than the United States negotiated the release of the two Michaels in exchange for a plea deal with Meng. There's nothing else here. And I think we also have to acknowledge that I, that I, I do not believe that, that the prime minister of Canada played any role in, in the successful return of the two Michaels. I think that Canada and the U S had a conversation saying this is what we're going to do. And what I want to know as a, as a private citizen is what was promised in that meeting. What was promised in that meeting to bring those two Michaels home? Like what did, what did Justin Trudeau agree to? Because you know he didn't do this. You know the United States did this. You know that the United States brought these two Michaels home. So I wanna know what was promised. And I think as a public citizen, and I definitely think the conservative party can stop talking about who's vaccinated, who has the right to be vaccinated, who should show that they're vaccinated, drop all that and start to say, wait a minute, what do we owe here? Because we know that this was a complete failure of the, of the Trudeau government to bring these two Michaels home. We know that this was the force of a deal with the United States to bring them home. And maybe rightfully so, because the United States got Canada into this. However, what was promised? Because everything is a deal to be brokered. And you know that the United States is cunning enough not to say like, yeah, we'll do this for you because whatever we like, what you. did, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that would be living in a fantasy world. So what yeah. was promised? And I don't know why the conservatives aren't like a dog on a bone with that. What hasn't been getting a lot of play recently and on the subject of China is the Chinese scientist in Winnipeg. Yeah. What happened there? It seems the like the election happened and O'Toole was talking about it for a while there and then his numbers dipped and now it's a non-issue and no one seems to be talking about it. 
But Ooh. where is also the role of our investigative journalists? I True. mean, last I checked, taxpayer dollars pay for the CBC. Why isn't why isn't that been fully reported? Wait, where are all the Freedom of Information Acts? Why is it falling on policy groups and advocacy groups to figure out what's going on there? Yeah, that is a right of every citizen to know what happened. That's an that's our right to understand intelligence. We absolutely should know what's going on there. You're absolutely right, and it's both of those things compounding. The other piece of this that we can't forget is what is going on with 5G. What is going on with 5G? We will Why have a not- statement on that in a week's time. Well, maybe a month. Okay, possibly a year, according to Justin Trudeau. Okay. So like, if there's one thing that should unite all Canadians, it would be to say we do not want that Chinese tech in here. We're following with a lot of Commonwealth countries. We're following with a lot of, like okay. the best practice here is that we do not want this inside of our Canadian infrastructure. There are other tech options. We are beholden to nothing to China to take this, to take this piece of tech. So this, this is where the part where I think you and I will start disagreeing a little bit here. Canada's rel- Canada relies on China for a lot of goods, a lot of goods. You turn over a lot of the products that you're using right now, you're talking on, you're uh, listening on, and they're made in China. I, I, I would hope, 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 that we say no to the 5G Hawaii deal. I just just don't, I don't like it. I think Bell and Rogers and Shaw and AT&T and whoever can do a better deal for Canada, but we have become so reliant on China that we have to realize that we can't just say no and then think, oh, that's the end of ever having China in our backyard because China's already in our backyard. We already have products that are coming here. We have uh, phones that are made in China that are being sold here in Canada and people are happy to buy them because they're cheap and reliable. So they're willing to buy them and they're willing to move forward. When it comes to the 5G issue, I don't want to see it, but I don't like the double edge play that people are playing of, we don't like China because they're going to spy on us. If they're doing it, they're already doing it. I apologize to say that, but they're already spying on us. Plain and simple. Um, you know what? Please then send your thoughts and prayers to Chris directly to the link in the show bio because that is an epidemic. That is a, a deplorable display of climax thinking, believing that just the way it is today is the way it has to be. Uh, yeah, we have a huge trade deficit with China. We we ship a lot of cheap quality goods here. Um, we have options when it comes to 5G. And I feel like that this is, this is negotiating with terrorists. This is about saying we have to accept this piece of te- technology because where will we get our, you know, $1.99 coloring books? Like that's, I think that's, that's climax thinking, believing that the way it is, is the way it has to be. Um, I, I, so I, re- Jen I just doesn't want to go back to China ever again. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wish me luck <laughs> on my future travels to, to China. I actually, it's funny that you should say that because I actually have a striking number of followers from China to my podcast. It's actually quite an unnerving, quite an unnerving thing to know that there's that, that thought. If you talk, if you talk about China and you talk about it in a critical way, um, that, they're, they're listening. But I, I do think that what you have to remember is that as part of the constitution of China, that if you have a company uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the government wants what that company has to offer, they have a, uh, a, a responsibility and they have a, a mandate and it's forced upon them as the law to turn over that information. And that is a striking amount of information that Huawei would have about Canada. And I just think if other countries like Australia are saying no, um, and, and I mean, l- let there be fair market competition, but I don't think we're beholden upon China to do this. Again, for those who want to send notes and uh, angry <laughs> tweets and all that fun <laughs> stuff to me, I would highly suggest you use the contact form and I will file it in the appropriate location as I filed all my other angry emails that I've gotten in the That's last right. three weeks. That's right. That's right. On the topic of China still, China's making a move in Afghanistan. Yes. They are uh, the, 
I, I hate using the word government when it comes to the now interim, whatever the hell you want to call it, shit show that is the Afghanistan uh, government that is currently in place after the Americans pulled out. But China is making a play for uh, a loving relationship with the Taliban. The Taliban government that is currently in place in Afghanistan is getting its first high-level meeting with a foreign entity tomorrow, which is Tuesday, so yesterday, for those who are listening to this on Wednesday. So I, I, I was reading this, and I was just, I was appalled that this was happening. But the Chinese foreign minister is meeting with the Taliban government in Qatar Tuesday morning. This yes, sir. is in potential of the Chinese government giving the Taliban government of Afghanistan $31 billion worth of aid. Yeah, with a specific vision behind it. Exactly. If you do not think, and we, we, I'm going to talk about something else after you answer this question, but this is a colossal fuck up for Joe Biden. He has what? A pulling out the government, pulling out the military in Afghanistan, allowing this to happen, the, the, the rise of the Taliban in Afghanistan, colossal fuck up of Joe Biden. Uh, he did it wrong. I think everyone can admit to that. I don't think everyone, ex everyone excluding you can admit that, I think, after the next statement. China, China now playing in Afghanistan is hurting the Americans. Do you not agree with that? Um, okay, how do I unpack this in like, okay, there was like 17 parts to that statement. So let me just try to go from the top. So this is always the danger of focusing on like what happened and not asking enough questions about what happens next, right? Everybody's looking back and being like, oh my God, that was a nightmare in Afghanistan. We all saw the pictures of people clinging from aircraft and, and, it, and we were, you know, overwhelmed by those visual images. Not enough people were asking, what does this destabilization mean next? So history of Afghanistan in one minute or less, you know, Russia tried to, to, to make a go with something with Afghanistan, you know, tried to get involved, saw it as an opportunity to sell arms and, 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 and make some money and, and see if they could participate in their interests. The United States, of course, makes a response in Afghanistan as a result to, to 9-11, great cooperation and support um, to, to, to find and, and hunt Osama bin Laden. We knew coming out of the Bush administration and into the Obama administration, that no matter what was going to happen in Afghanistan, it was largely going to end the same way that Vietnam did. It really started to mirror the failures of Vietnam quite quickly. Whoa. And I, I think, yeah, I absolutely think it does. I think if you look at um, the forces that support Afghanistan, if you look at the relationship that Pakistan has had with the Taliban, if you look at the continued destabilization, if you looked at how there were, you know, changing attitudes at, at about the 10 to 15 year mark, you, you had a real sense from, from, a, um, a, from a historical, from a military historical point of view, that there was a likelihood that the extraction from Afghanistan was going to mirror quite a bit what happened in Vietnam, like that exit from Saigon. And if you look at those images, I mean, certainly that's not the outcome that I, that anybody wanted, but I think people who were studying this from a pragmatic view, and I think the Joe Biden administration, especially the people who, who were military people. And I think it's really too bad that, that Colin Powell has, has died because it would really have been, I think, impactful to have him weigh in from such a, I mean, you know, from such a qualified point of view around whether he believed that this was going to end this way as well. I think it's too bad that he's, he's passed because I think his, his perspective in this would matter a lot actually. Um, but I think that there, so we have this striking destabilization, but making the case to keep troops there as the growth of the Taliban continued for a second wave. I mean, you know, international support was waning. There was only so much that America could do. And extractions like these are incredibly complicated. They, I don't think anybody from a military perspective could have anticipated that the Taliban would have moved to Kabul that quickly. 
I think it did surprise American Intel uh, how quickly they moved to Kabul. You could, I, for people who are listening to the audio version of this, I am getting a sound effect blast of facial expressions from Chris here. Uh, and I'm, I'm prepared to stand by my laurels here because you knew that that extraction was going to be messy. So everybody's in the hot wash of what a mess this is. But what doesn't get recognized here is that with chaos spells opportunity and the opportunity is never so ripe as it is for China. Do you want me to keep going or would you like to digest oh, on I'm what happened? I'm going to interject here for about like 12 minutes on just a rant of if your military I, leaders are telling you that if we pull out, nothing potentially bad is going to happen. And if they are not going through X, Y, and Z, or X, A, A through Z scenarios of what could potentially happen, you need to fire those generals right now. Because if they're telling you that we, the Taliban are possibly not going to take it, take uh, the capital of Kabul back in 24 hours, they need to be fired because they were ready. When, when Joe Biden said, this is the date, you guarantee that there was some Taliban official was tuned, tuned into CNN and went, well, we know what day we're going in. Let's ready the troops. I just, I don't understand how you can sit here and say that, and oh, this, <laughs> that it's not their fault. It's not, it is their fault. The fact that we have people who have now died in Afghanistan and their deaths were in vain because everything that they did for the last 20 years was rolled back in 24 hours. It's just, it's appalling that Joe Biden does not wear this for the rest of his term. You okay there? <laughs> I am good. Wait, I'm not so, even going to talk about Vietnam for a few minutes, but I'm just. just... So this is this is my this is my point of view. Um, I have oh, not served. I, have, <laughs> I am. I have not served in the military. Um, I have not served in the military, uh, but I trust. I I trust the the strategic nature and the counsel of four star generals, especially those who who played a central role in Afghanistan to support their, their, their country for, for more than 20 years. Extractions like these are messy. Um, and, you know, to, to see not, to, I think we're, we focus on the images of, you know, people clinging to aircraft and shots being fired and people running for their life with, with nothing on their back and feeling this sense of like, I, I, I helped now you help me, right. This is the deal that we, this is the handshake deal we struck. Um, the images that we largely didn't see were U.S. military holding that airport, um, trying to keep it as secure as they could, as it was absolutely massive pandemonium. Um, you know, people f flying aircraft in and out, not knowing who was clinging to that aircraft, not knowing. I mean, think of a pilot, you know, trying to take off a plane and you see a, a woman in, with her child clinging to the, to the wing of that aircraft. I mean, the, the sheer post-traumatic stress that will, that will emerge from not just the invasion or not just the occupation of, of Afghanistan, but the extraction from Afghanistan. I, you know, I, I hope that the supports are there. America has a tendency to fall short of, of veteran supports. I think what we, we need to appreciate and have some respect for is that you can have the best possible laid plans and then when chaos breaks out, you absolutely are doing the best that you can. I think where we should be looking, rather than our criticism of the United States, where we should be looking is that what was Canada's responsibility to the interpreters, um, to the supports, to the intelligence that helped Canadians? Because we were we had a responsibility to extract our own and we had a restract we had an op, we had a responsibility to to extract people who who acted in in providing interpretive services or intelligence services and i think that we were too reliant on the united states to guide the plan when we should have had a plan of our own so you'll have to just forgive me here that yeah i i think we can point a lot of fingers at the at the united states and there are some particular maneuvers that i just kind of go oh it must be because I don't have an intelligence or, or a military background to understand that. But I do point a big finger at our government to say, where were we? Where were we to get this right? People had no communication, no information. People, families were separated. There, it was impossible to get documentation. I mean, a, a good, anyone who thinks with a mind of business continuity, anyone who thinks with an emergency response mind, 
knows that there was a whole lot that could have been done to, to look at. We know an extraction is coming. We know an, an extraction is going to be messy. What are we going to do? And I think that, that Canada should largely be held to account that for our small part, we fucked up. Oh, I completely agree. I, 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 I'm, I'm labeling this as a Joe Biden failure, but I'm also labeling this as a Boris Johnson failure, a Justin Trudeau failure, a Scott Morrison failure. All G7 nations, uh, Emmanuel Macron, Macron, French Emmanuel president. Emmanuel Macron. There you go. My French is not the best at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, it, it is a failure on an international level, but... I hope, and I was not in any meetings. I, I'm not an intelligence officer. I'm not a military officer. I'm not a representative of Canadian government to America or anything. I hope that Joe Biden picked up the phone to the G6 slash seven leaders and said, this is happening. Get your ducks in a row. Because if the, Joe Biden did this by himself, and I, I like Joe Biden. I do not agree. I don't agree with him on this issue. Uh, it is a failure yeah, but, but of all self, levels of government. Where's the self-efficacy of each country to be watching the tea leaves? I mean, where, where, why did they need a call from Joe Biden to say, like, we're, we're out? Like, if you read the tea leaves, you could see this is the growth of the Taliban. You know, Joe Biden had been campaigning on the premise that he's going to leave Afghanistan. Well, you know, a lot of people had been talking in the intelligence community that it was, it was time to go. And I know what you're going to say. A lot of other a lot of other presidents talked about going, but Joe Biden put together a team to, for the extraction. That's a different thing. That's the mobilization of assets and resources for that. So there, I think there is a quantifiable difference. But before, see, this is what we do. This drives me crazy. This is what we do. We're so busy having a hot wash about what happened in Afghanistan that we're not talking about the chaos that has presented a tremendous opportunity for China. So refocusing there, because I'm just taking over now, Chris, sorry. Here's what we know to be true. Afghanistan is full of essential minerals to do things that globally we've identified as a priority, right? Their ability to mine minerals for chip technology and also the energy to fuel chip technology both live in Afghanistan. Anybody who understands the resources of Afghanistan knows this. China knows this and is prepared to do the two things that they do best. One, leverage their infrastructure, which is their belt and road initiative, and use economic power to control the environment, right? America went in to bring justice and then freedom. Ch uh, Russia came in to make money. Now, if China can come in and strike a deal, and you, this meeting in Qatar will set the stage for it, if China can come in and say to Afghanistan, we're going to give you the one thing that has really been held out from you. And that is true economic prosperity. That's making you a player at the stage, giving you money, giving you, giving you res like resources to create and curate the experience that you want for Afghanistan. We can do that. And all we're asking is for access to your technology and we'll make you a very rich nation. And for them who have been so governed by their morals and their values and, and, and you know, what they can be and what they can't be coming to the table and saying, we don't give a shit what you are. Just, we want, we want to extract what you have and we want to make you very rich to do it. That's a deal that the Taliban is going to take right away. And then what does the United States, what does the international community, what does Russia do? What do we do? Well, then what do we do? And I think it's really important to, to understand really this Belt and Road Initiative because I think people kind of gloss over it. Major infrastructure has been done to create these corridors to, to move goods and to trade them um, through large swaths of this country. It's nothing like, it's, it's like 50 times what the Marshall Plan was after the First World War. And so I, I think if you look at a map of the Belt and Road, and I hope anyone that's listening does, you'll see that in Pakistan, uh, the Ghadar uh, port has been basically sold to China. Yep. So one of Pakistan's central ports has been sold to China. And that matters because, you know, say what you will, Pakistan was a big player in propping up the success of Afghanistan, right? They would move arms, they would trade people, even, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden, where did we find him? Oh, we found him in Pakistan, our so-called ally, right? Their so-called ally. Pakistan has played a significant role in helping Afghanistan to be successful. And now look at this, they'll come to the table as a major player here, right? Extracting from 
uh, Afghanistan, moving it through Pakistan, moving it right into the central port of that's now owned by China and allowing China to distribute it to their massive infrastructure, right? Moving it back to China to create goods with it, moving it to other places to manufacture with it or trade it. I mean, this is a great deal for Afghanistan and it puts them at a place to say now, not only are we whatever we want to be because we have economic stability, we have more money than we know what to do with, uh, but now we're, we have protections from China, which of course is not just an economic power. It's also by a tremendous fight dirty military. And I think that that should cause us great concern. And I think that I'm disappointed here in Canada that what are we doing? We're taking pot shots at Saudi Arabia uh, for their human rights record while we, while we bring in their, their tankers of oil because we can't pull them out of the ground here. Um, you know, we, we take pot shots. Like that's what we're doing. We, um, you know, we, we, we get, you know, we get frustrated. We send out a message that, you know, what happened to Jamal Khashoggi is the worst thing ever. And then we're like, but we also just want to sell arms to you. And I, I think, and then we, we have this bullshit excuse that, oh, well, we investigate human rights. And then 1.1% of contracts get canceled for that reason, which is, you know, who's, who's that guy? Who's that rubber stamp guy? Who's that guy who's going to step in front of a, a trade deal? Uh, on behalf of the government that both governments that want the deal. So I think we have to really look at, um, and, and, and if you care from an environment, if you don't care from a military perspective and you don't care from a safety perspective, maybe you'll care from an environmental perspective because we have to remember that this quarter, um, China has doubled down on coal. I mean, I love that we're like fighting to figure out where we're going to meet our Paris Climate Accord um, targets. And, and China has said we're going to double down on, on coal. And more importantly, it has told their banking systems to open up all their credit systems for anyone who wants to be in the business of coal. Right. Open up your credit systems, make it very easy for people to invest and, 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 and make coal a central part of our of our of our Chinese economy. So. Maybe if it doesn't matter to you from like a human rights perspective or an international relations or peace and safety and security or from an equality standpoint, because the quality of life for girls is going to get real tough in Afghanistan. Maybe you carry, maybe you care from an environmental perspective because it's bad now. It's getting bad. And I think that this becomes beholden upon Canadians to understand that there's a conversation about like what's happening in China. And then we also over here have this like, oh my God, it was a, it was a bloodbath in Afghanistan. But I think what we haven't really come together as a nation to understand is that we are at the precipice of these two countries coming together. And what does that mean? How bad is that? I, I think there's a one party you're leaving out. And I think he has a financial economic interest in Afghanistan as well. Uh, you mentioned them briefly, and that is Russia. Russia is the third party that we have to be worried about when if they want Afghanistan because they did they did they they did it militarily what uh, what China is doing economically which was we want to go in and get the resources that are in Afghanistan because they are beneficial to our needs and our future um, we all remember how that ended up America gave money to the Taliban, which was the rise of these, then the fighters, the resistant fighters who now have those guns and who are the military and who are the government is the Taliban. So congratulations yeah. America for doing that in the nineties, because really you've been leading us down this path for a while, but yeah, some I want to talk to Roost. I just, just want to say, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say on the topic of Russia, you know, it should be not forgotten upon us that they are they are building icebreakers and um, they are understanding that with them, with the melting of our permafrost, that they understand that there's places that they can go to now that they couldn't before. I think we were spending a lot of time and attention on, are they going to come up to the Northwest West passage? Like all of a sudden is a Russian, a Russian icebreaker going to show up in Northern Canada uh, and Alaska. And I think what it is the more important important imperative to look at is that these icebreakers would also help to transport Russia to China if they go the other way. And I think that they, there's an eagerness there to, to work together. Um, and I think watch for, cause it'll start with a PR stunt. It'll start with a PR stunt of an icebreaker moving from, from Russia to China. And as two countries that really do enjoy propaganda based leadership, I think we should pay attention to, to those pivots and, and understand what that means for us at the global stage, right? Us with all those undefended borders, just a thought. Agreed wholeheartedly. Um, 
I want to turn to the last subject here because I'm just looking at the clock and we're about an hour into this and it seems like it hasn't been an hour. It seems like it's been 10 minutes, but here we are. I, I don't know if that's to- a compliment or not. It is because I enjoy <laughs> talking to you and it seems like time flies. And I feel like when I look at the clock, I was like, oh, it's been an hour. But I want to talk about a subject that is not as important as what's happening in Afghanistan, but the power vacuum that has been put into the European Union, the G7, with the resignation, the departure of Angela Merkel, the Chancellor for Germany. Now the EU doesn't have a, it has its leader, it has its president of the European Union, but it doesn't have its stalwart. It doesn't have its person that can, or the European Union can look at and say, hey, Germany, how are we going to fix this? Because Germany has been looked down since 2004, since Angela Merkel took over that position, and she has become a de facto world leader over Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, And with her leaving, this leaves a power vacuum. Who fills it, in your opinion? Do we have a person who is going to potentially fill that uh, position? Or is Germany going to be relic to second-class country again after Merkel leaves, which is happening here shortly? Well, I I want to challenge a little bit what you said there, because I do think that... in, within the European Union, I don't think that those other countries said, like, let's look to Germany. I think that those countries said, let's look to Angela Merkel. I think she was that yes. much of a person that she sort of circumvented her role as, as, as the chancellor of Germany. I mean, she had great leadership of Germany, let's be clear. And I don't think Germany will see a, a leader like that, a disciplined leader like that for a long time. Uh, But I think when it comes to the European Union, I think that people didn't look at her as being also the leader of a country. I think they looked at her just as like Angela Merkel and and what she was capable of doing. I'd like to see Angela Merkel get the Nobel Peace Prize just for being Angela Merkel. And I want that to be on the little on the little placard on the on the on the medal itself, just like just for being you. you, you get this Nobel Peace Prize. We don't have a category. It's just here you go because of the, the Nobel the, Pri- Nobel prize and Angela Merkel in, in, in Merkeling <laughs> goes to Angela Merkel every year. Um, I think but there is she, no leader to take over that position because no I other. was looking at the list of the European union. And I was like, I don't know who this person is. The closest one I got to is Italy who just became prime minister of Italy and He's the world, econ- he's, he was the former yeah, chair. he does have an economic mind, right? He is an economist and I think that will be great. But the other thing you have to remember about Italy is that he also has to represent Il- Italy's interests in the UN, which is, hi, we're broke again. So you have to, like Megan, like Merkel didn't have that challenge because she, you know, it's not like Germany was also in economic crisis, right? Germany had, you know, disciplined, um, policy and, 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 and you talk about intentionality, I think in the, in the EU, they had a clear vision of what they wanted to accomplish things they didn't want to be a part of, uh, things that they wanted to see achieved. And then she could, I think that's why she could amass to this, to this larger than life character. While I like the leadership out of Italy, I, I don't think that you can play those two roles. And I think the leader there knows that. Yeah. The, the logic thought would be, you know, as the next kingmaker, Emmanuel Macron out of France, I think no. Because <laughs> I think no. Traditionally, presidents of France don't last more than four years after the last few. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, we'll see. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, we'll we'll see. They do like to switch out their leadership, but I don't, I don't know what becomes of of the new world order of the EU. I also don't know where she goes next. Because I like I, I there's been a great debate even in my own home, we with, we're talking about how she she'll just retire and I I just don't think so, I I I'm trying to figure out where she'll go next right like the UNHCR the human the United Nations Human High Commission for Human Rights Commissioner for Human Rights, is Michelle Bachelet the former president of Brazil you know her term is you know will Angela Merkel go there because of her leadership of what to do with refugees uh, will she go there. Um, you know, Antonio Gutierrez, who's the security general for or the secretary general for the UN is not popular. Will she go there? Um, you know, she was, she was the, the largest voice of influence at the world bank. 
will she go there? Um, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out where she will go next. Um, the thought in, in my own household, which if you listen to my podcast, you know, my father joins me quite often. And his point of view is that she can't have any of those jobs because they're too public facing. She needs to be like the conciliary to some like behind the scenes influencer, uh, somewhere. Um, I, I, his best guess was, would she be part of an envoy to China? Like a global envoy to China to try to, to, to bring perspective there just to wrap this whole episode around, right? Would she, would she be there saying, let's talk about how we mitigate the, the, the rise of a new superpower and the threat to, to China? Would, would that be a, a place of, cause like when Megan, when Megan, I keep calling her Megan, Megan Markle. when uh, Megan Markle, when Megan Markle speaks, people <laughs> listen, when Angela uh, Merkel speaks, people, people do listen. And Even I think Putin listens, right? That, that's, that's right. The thing. Like if Putin listens to Angela Merkel, the She's got well, she's an incredibly bright person, hence why I think she should be a Nobel Peace Prize winning person. For what I'm not sure because there's so many things to pick from, but I'm I, I, would she would she be better on a on a on a quiet private envoy to China? Would she be better as like a and some sort of an ambassadorial role? Um, but I don't think she's gonna like go like urban gardening. Let's be, I just don't think that's that's first of all, that's not fair right? Those leaders are hard to find. And in a world where we talk about gender balance cabinets and women in places of power and how important identity politics is today, I think Angela Merkel stands alone as one of the most powerful women that we have ever had in the history of a long time. There's about three or four women who I would equate to Angela Merkel's status in Golda Meir, uh, Maggie Thatcher and um, the name's blanking right now. Anyway, there are a few women who can stand upon the shoulders of Angela Merkel or be in the same category as her. And those are a few. So um, here we are, hour and 20 minutes into this episode. And I've had fun. This has been a blast. What are your last words on international politics for the next 30 days that people can digest and look into for themselves? You know, I, I fear that, that people who are listening have a tendency to, to turn a blind eye because it falls into their, in just outside of what they can manage from a crisis perspective. And what I want to say is that I know that people are, you know, they've got waning mental health because they've been dealing with COVID you know, we've had tremendous political instability. If you live in Calgary, it's a tough time, you know, municipally, um, provincially, federally. Um, these things can be quite demoralizing, demoralizing. And it's easy to see international politics as being just like, oh, this is going to be soul crushing. But, you know, take a purview through, um, you know, the the economist, you know, you know, take an opportunity to listen to podcasts like mine and others who are like, let's unpack these things because, at the end of the day, I'll say something that my grandfather used to say, which is that the intellectual capability and contributions of our citizens is our greatest natural resource in this country. Our us as thinking beings is the greatest thing that we can do to contribute to our, our landscape. And it requires the participation of everyone. And if this is your first foray into international politics and you're like, oh, where do I go from here? pick up a newspaper, um, you know, go to your local chapters and, and, and find a, you know, find some magazines and, and start to read about it and, um, you know, engage, engage people. Engage like there's no tomorrow. Um, I will say that we are not a house. Canada is not a house. Uh, we are an apartment building. We have other people in this building who we need to look after and we need to look at because what happens in the floor below or the floor uh, the, the apartment next to us matters so while international relations might not be the biggest thing that you're worried about you got to um, what happens municipally matters if your garbage gets picked up it matters if your water flows it matters what happens provincially with healthcare, it matters. What happens federally with military, it matters. What happens in China, fucking matters. 
So for the next few months, uh, probably for the next, until this show is done, we will be talking about international matters because in this apartment building that is called the world, it matters what our neighbors are doing. So we are going to focus on our neighbors and talk about how Canada plays a role in our neighbor's backyard. Jen, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. It was fun. It was a pleasure. And we will be back in uh, a month's time to uh, talk about the biggest political, uh, the biggest international political news stories and how Canada's role is there. Um, for everyone listening, thank you so much for tuning in. We will be back. Well, as you, I will be back tomorrow morning live with another episode of the Cross Board Interview Podcast, but also live with the cabinet swearing in. We actually no, this is Wednesday that's coming out, so it's this already happened. Wednesday. Wow! Wow! <laughs> Oh, you have I to just, start to record these in order, buddy. I, I really got to because <laughs> I am so out of it these days. I, I take four days off from recording any interviews, and now I'm just completely up creek without a paddle. So we are not back tomorrow live, but we will be back tomorrow with our entertainment rundown, talking about the biggest entertainment news stories throughout the country and around the world. So with that, my name is Christopher Brown. This has been... Crossing All Borders on the Cross Border Interview Podcast with Jennifer Sanford. Jen, thank you. Thank you.